Um, now, so Thomas kindly agreed to introduce the speaker. So. Okay, thank you, Tobias. So our today's speaker is Eva Llabres. She, as you know, is a postdoc at our institute for about uh, more than a year, a little bit more than a year. And, um, well, I will talk a little bit about her scientific career. Uh, she has been quite a restless person. She, got a, uh, uh, she was graduated in physics at the University of uh, Barcelona. Then she moved to the, to the Netherlands at the uh, Brich University of Amsterdam, where she made the, uh, the Master in Science in Theoretical Physics, that is a standard in most of European countries, a two-year master. And uh, then she did her PhD also at the University of Amsterdam in a quite different topic that is uh, basically quantum gravity. Uh, uh, during this time, she also has been a visitor at uh, several places, for instance, at the Galileo Galilei Institute of Theoretical Physics in Florence, Italy, and also at the Perimeter Institute in Waterloo in Canada. Uh, afterwards, she did uh, a, a postdoc in, at the University of uh, in Paris, at the Paris Saclay. And for uh, two years, she was working there, also in topics very much related to theoretical physics, in uh, following her PhD in string theory, in a string theory group working in several topics as black holes, quantum chaos in gravitational systems, the emergence of space-time, and from which she has uh, quite a bit of highly cited contributions. Then she moved to the IFISC uh, about, about one year ago, and she changed completely the, uh, her research. And he's presently working on uh, modeling ecological systems, in particular, developing numerical and mathematical models to provide a theoretical framework to study the dynamics of seagrass meadows. And basically what she will explain us today is the most relevant results uh, we have found in this uh, last year. And therefore the title of the talk is related to, to this topic and the title is Interspecific Interactions in Seagrass Meadows using a microscopic uh, approach or a microscopic numerical approach. Uh, um, well, as she told me before starting, you can interrupt her at any time. Don't, you don't need to wait the, 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 at the end of the talk. So she will be pleased to answer your questions uh, during the talk. Don't wait at the end. So thanks, Eva. So you can start at you want. Yeah. Thanks, Thomas, for the introduction. So, as Thomas told you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna talk about um, uh, our results during this year. So, this is uh, soon gonna become a paper. Uh, well, it's not yet submitted, but it's gonna be submitted in a couple of weeks. Uh, and it's a collaboration with some people with Imedea, Elvira Mayoal and Nuria Marva. And so, and here there is an outline of the of the talk. So first, I'm gonna introduce uh, what sea grasses are and how we model them. Then I'm gonna explain what uh, new results or what new uh, effects uh, we added to the model uh, that is gonna be to add in um, interactive effects. And also, I'm gonna show that with this we are able to reproduce field results of two seagrasses that we find here in Mallorca and that are Caulerpa prolifera and Timodoceano dosa. And also, if I have time, I'm going to explain you some, uh, some recent results that are an uh, ongoing, ongoing project uh, that is like how to reproduce uh, interactions between Posidonia and Timodoceano dosa with a uh, global warming scenario. So, OK, uh, we start. Uh, First, uh, so I want to explain you what seagrasses are. So seagrasses are aquatic plants um, that form extensive, extensive meadows under the sea. So I, I like to say, or to refer them as an underwater forest. So they are basically the equivalent of forests. So because 
fishes and other organisms live, uh, reproduce and eat in them. And also they are very important because they capture a great amount of CO2. Uh, sometimes, uh, like not sometimes, they, they actually they capture much uh, CO2 than rainforest. And they are also very important because protect coasts from erosion. So they protect the beaches. And, and it's a pity because they are in regression uh, due to several uh, human factors, uh, for example, waste, uh, anchoring, and climate change. So here oh. I, show you, I show you a picture of like an anchor of a boat uh, that it's when like boats anchor on, on top of the sea grasses, they, they, they kill them. So, and what happens is like this, the sea grasses have a very slow growth rate so Posidonia oceanica, I forgot to say, is a, so there are different kinds of seagrasses, uh, different species. And Posidonia oceanica is the, the most common and, the, and also the most important because it's the, the one that has bigger leaves and, and creates a like, greater ecosystem. So the Posidonia has a road rate of two centimeters a year. So if a boat uh, anchors on one of them and kills a part of the plant, this, this will take a long time to recover. But also climate change is very, very damaging. So, but I will talk about this later. So, okay, uh, introduction of the plant. And okay, another thing I want to explain, it's a bit the, before explaining the model, is uh, the anatomy of the plant. So here in the, in the right, uh, you see a drawing of the, of the plant. Um, and I realize I do not have a pointer. Well, anyway, so you see this part, this green part are the leaves. So the leaves group in shoots of a number of leaves, like four or five. And the, the, this is above ground and the part, uh, the brown part is below ground. So these are the, it's called rhizome. And it's like a, a, like a stem that is below ground. And they, the Posidonia also produce flowers. We have fruits to reproduce sexually but uh, to reproduce sexually, but the main, the main uh, uh, reproduction uh, process is asexual and it's a clonal growth. So at the tip of, the, of, the, of this rhizome, there is an apex. This, uh, the, the tip of the rhizome is called apex. And what happens is that this apex keeps on growing uh, indefinitely and ramifying. So what this does is that it creates an underground network of of um, of rhizomes and roots that create these very very extensive meadows uh, and this is what we call the clonal reproduction and this is what is going to help us to uh, model the plant and uh, yeah here at the at the left i have i, I'm, I have a picture of a like i think that is very interesting uh, that so these plants actually can grow a lot and and uh, like an, um, the same uh, individual it can be uh, like it can go through like many kilometers of distance so for example uh, between uh, Formentera and Ibiza there is uh, uh, the estimated uh, uh, oldest living uh, uh, organism on earth so it's dated between 80,000 80, 2,000 years uh, and this is a paper uh, by Sofia Renaud and, and also Tomas, uh, where they were able, they found two clones of the same plant or two, like two shoots of the same, of the, of the same plant uh, with the same DNA, 15 kilometers apart. So this plant, this, this metal grow 15 kilometers and they were able to estimate the, the, the age of this meadow using the models that I'm gonna explain now. Okay, so um, the models. Uh, so the model is based in these clonal rules, in this clonal rules that I explained you. So uh, it's a step model that I start with a seed. That is this drawing that I have here, that it's a seed that carries a, a shoot and an apex. So, and at each iteration, this seed uh, or this, this shoot, or the, sorry, this rhizome will grow a distance d and with a velocity v. Also, it has some, uh, some um, probability of ramifying, which is given by r. And also at each iteration, there will be some shoots selected at random 
and they and they will they will be killed. So these these four these four parameters, the length, the velocity, the ranching rate, and the mortality rate, are are uh, what define the clonal roots, clonal growth rule, rule sorry, and uh, and they are measurable from, directly from field experiments. And each species have a different a different set of of parameters. So, for example, ah, so measure for field observation exactly. So and okay and the the result of this model, for example, here you see uh, there is here you see the, the the network system that I show you underground of the rhizome. So these green these green lines are the rhizomes and the um, and the dot and the red dots are the apexes. So and here you have a time evolution of how the system grows and this the, these are results for Simoceanodosa. And also uh, on the right, you have uh, I we plotted the the shoot density, uh, the evolution of the shoot density in these meadows. Also, you see that there is an exponential an exponential growth at the beginning, and then the density saturates, uh, and this corresponds actually to to observations of what the meadows of the meadows do. So okay, this uh, is a discrete model, a macroscopic model, as we call it. Because at each step, I have information of every shoot, like the position, the age, uh, and this uh, is very precise, but at the same time, it's computationally uh, heavy. So there are other models that you might have heard uh, about by Damia, uh, Pablo, Ruland, that are based on equation, uh, equation of diffusion, uh, diffusion equations of. Um, uh, uh, densities. So these are much, uh, this is more like easier to manipulate in a sense, uh, but they have less information of um, uh, or a specific information. They should give, both models should give the same results, but some are, one of them is like better to explain some of them, uh, some effects or to study some effects and the other is good for another one. Uh, in our case, so will be good because we are going to study interaction between species. Uh, it will be good to know what happens at front, so we need also detailed information about the about the system. So, uh, okay, good. Uh, so this uh, this so far was a model without interactions, and now I'm going to add interactions. Uh, so. We know that this happens because there, there are so the shoots um, that live in overpopulated and underpopulated regions are more likely to die. This is for two reasons. In overpopulated regions, what happens is that the that the shoots have a competition amongst nutrients, and and in underpopulated regions, there are, for example, uh, less protected to herbi uh, to currents or herbivores that might eat them. So the way that we have to implement these effects is to uh, to make the ramification rate probability dependent on the density of the meadow or on the density of the meadow around the shoot. So here you have this formula: uh, R is the ramification rate, the ranching rate, and rho hat is the um, is the then the normalized density by is normalized with a uh, like with a Roma, a Romax, an optimal Romax. So this uh, this uh, branching, we see that it's uh, so it's represented in this figure here. Uh, it's a like symmetric parabola that it centers this optimal Romax or Romax half. Uh, so we see that it reproduces the the expected effect because densities with uh, low densities and high densities are penalized and they are less likely to ramify. But uh, there is a, an optimal density around which ramifying uh, would be uh, encouraged. That is Romax half. Okay, so now we have interaction among shoots of same species, so self-interaction. Now we can add it, we can add two species that I'm gonna call one and two. So now the ramification will depend in both densities. So I use the same formula as before, but now rho hat is this weighted density. 
So this weighted density, uh, if I plug it in the, so the sup index one is, it means that it's a ramification of, of, uh, of the species one. If I plug it in, we see that it depends in both densities or on densities of the both of both plants. And the same will happen for the ramification of the species too. So what is very important here is this weighted density in these weighted densities is these, uh, these gammas. These gammas are the couplings, the, the interspecific interactions. So they are a measure of the strength of the interaction. You see that if I, uh, I place uh, gamma zero, we reproduce the formula above where there is no interaction. And, and if I increase the, the, the value of gamma, there will be a stronger interaction with the other species. So, and here, uh, these parameters uh, are, cannot be fixed uh, directly from field observations as I had the ramification of the velocity I showed you before. So this is gonna be the, one of the tricky parts of the, of the problem is of, the, of, of this project is to uh, fix these, these interactions uh, indirectly. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna expect the model or, uh, in, so check the model for different, uh, for different uh, parameters and see what can correspond to field observations. Um, okay, um, if anyone has any question, you can ask anytime. So, okay, well, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set, I'm gonna check this model uh, using a case study. Uh, of two plants, Thymonocea nodosa and Caulerpa prolifera. So Thymonocea nodosa is a plant, it's a seagrass, it's, it's of the same, uh, uh, it's, of the, it's similar to the Posidonia, but it has thinner leaves and thinner roots. Uh, and Caulerpa prolifera, it's, it's an algae, but, but it can, it, since it has clonal growth, it can also be developed uh, it can also be uh, reproduced with these models. So this, um, um, what else? Uh, uh, yeah, I chose these, these, these two plants for, for a few reasons. One is because they have similar growth rates. So, uh, and also it's, they are common here in Mallorca in mixed meadows. And as well, uh, they are proof to interact. So this is, uh, this is an experiment that was done by, by Tuya in this paper that I have here. Uh, that um, they show they go to, to meadows where they, they have mix, uh, they have coexistence of both species, and they rip off the caulerpa, and they see that in a couple of weeks, very fast, the Simonothea nodosa uh, recovers the space. So this shows that there was interaction if there would have been wouldn't have been interaction, the Simonocean also would have stayed the same. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, see if with my model, I can reproduce the three expected situations that I have. So the three expected situations that, that, that you can find in nature are that you find mixed meadows of both species, uh, that you have domains, so, monospecific meadows of one and the other species that join like and collide into a front and they do not mix and also just monospecific meadows. So, uh, and these drawings, I'm gonna explain now what they are, or these are the kinds of drawings I'm gonna reproduce and I'm gonna explain them more. And also I'm gonna like uh, check these parameters, uh, gamma and uh, see like how my model changes under the changes of gamma. Okay, so first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, fix the symmetric case for simplicity so that the two gammas are the same. And here I will find two differentiated cases. One that gamma is greater than one and one that it's smaller than one. So this makes sense since as you can see here in the weighted density, uh, row had one, um, the gamma, so the, the, the self-interaction, so gamma one is weighted with uh, one. So this means that if gamma, 
uh, sorry, I, I didn't say that right. So, so row, row one is weighted with one while row two is weighted with gamma one. So this means that if gamma one is greater than one, that there is more competition with shoots among of the other species than with the species of the, of, of the shoots of the same species. And the opposite for gamma, for gamma smaller than one. So what this leads is that for gamma bigger than one, I have domain separation. So the shoots tend to separate such that minimize the, the competition. So since they compete less with their own shoots, they don't mingle. As the, as the same, uh, at, at the same time for gamma smaller than one, I have mixed meadows because the shoots compete less with uh, the other species than with themselves. So they tend to mingle. And I will be able to reproduce these uh, results with, um, with uh, my model. So, so um, what I'm gonna do, um, I first, I will start with initial conditions. So this is a snapshot of the, of the density of the system. Uh, so you have uh, the, X and Y axes are, are the meters are the space and the color bar represents the difference between the density of one species and the other. So for positive values, uh, um, red, you have the do, like dominance of one species and for negative values, blue, you have the dominance of another one. And when it's green, you have a mixture of both. So I start with a completely green, um, green uh, uh, figure uh, as an initial condition. So homogeneous density of both metals, of both species. So if I let the system evolve, so very, uh, now I start with the case with gamma bigger than one. Uh, so I see very fastly that I get this domain separation I was explaining. So here I have the results for, for gamma equal two. Uh, and you see here the I have different snapshots of the system. So the 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 um, columns are different different years. So time evolution and uh, the rows correspond to different mortalities. So the first row is a mortality. I cannot see one seven something. I. Uh, and the second row is uh, one seven. Another thing, I have, I have the, I cannot move the, I cannot see the the slide completely because I have the the pictures and and the users on top of it. But they are two different mortalities. Okay, so uh, -uh where, where was I? Okay, yes, and at the right, I have uh, plotted the the evolution of the number of shoots with the age. Um, so blue is Thimo uh, and, and and red is Caulerpa prolifera. So we see here that uh, we have this, these fronts and these domains that I explained you, but these are um, uh, like uh, an unstable solution. It goes actually, if you wait for a long time, it will always uh, go to a more specific meadow. You see here in the 50 years that yeah, I have these islands um, in blue. So in, th in 300 years, these islands start joining and, and at some point it will completely displace the Caulerpa prolifera out of the, um, out of the, of the, oh, yeah, and I forget to say that here I have periodic conditions, sorry. And yeah, and also here in these two, in these two drawings, I have that the Timonothea nodosa is the one that domains the system. But if I change the mortality of Caulerpa, so if I lower the mortality of Caulerpa around 0, 0,7, uh, I, will, I will have that the Caulerpa nodosa is the, either Caulerpa prolifera is the one that uh, leads the system and uh, ends up as a monospecific uh, solution. 
So, so in this case, I have domain separation, but depending for, for a, a period. And then after I will, it will always lead to more specific meadows, depending on the mortality or the ratio of mortalities of both, uh, of both species. Okay. And now uh, I want to, I, I choose that the gammas are smaller than one. And here I can see that I have mixed meadows as, as we expected. So uh, here I have the results for the gammas equal to one half. In, in the figure A, uh, I plotted the densities of, um, of in the mixed meadows for different mortalities of the caulerpa. So each dash, dash line corresponds to a different mortality of the caulerpa. So, and we see that soon the, 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 the system uh, stabilizes and saturates to a constant density uh, for, for the mixed meadows. So in D, you see a snapshot, a snap, snapshot of the system uh, where it's basically greeny. So I have mixture of both uh, and what, what I did in, in, in figure B is to, so each point corresponds to the densities, the saturation densities of a mixed meadow of both species for a different mortality of the caulerpa. So the X axis is the mortality of the caulerpa. So we see that it changes very much depending on the mortality of the caulerpa the density that I will get, I will obtain in the mixed meadow. And the interesting figure is figure C, where I have um, plotted uh, the, shoot, uh, the density of Thenodosa in terms of the prolifera. So each point of this graphic corresponds to a couple of points of the graphic B. Uh, and you can see that this can be um, can be um, uh, fit by a slope, um, and this actually is going to be very important because these mixed meadows are the ones that we have on real life or in nature, so we can uh, um, compare to data. So this is what we did. So actually, uh, our collaborators from Imedea uh, had some data of mixed meadows of Caulerpa prolifera and, um, and Thymodocea nodosa. And from the uh, Delta, uh, Delta de Alebra, so they have 119 sites or points, uh, which are here represented in the in purple. So this purple can these purple points can be fitted uh, with a red with the red line. So you see that it's a bit dispersed and scattered and that the and that the R squared of the of the fit is 0 14 so it's not very big for physicists but for biologists this is not bad because they tend to have very scattered data. And, and at least like this, they have a tendency uh, the, of the system, how, like, how, it, uh, how it affects go. So this can actually, so coincides with the regression I showed you before. So the red, the green dots correspond to the, um, to the, um, to the, to the model. So it perfectly fits, the model fits the data if I choose a symmetric uh, interaction with uh, coefficient one half. So, um, okay. So now I'm gonna show you uh, why fitting this, um, this model, uh, the model using this procedure uh, fitting the, the, um, 
the coefficients using the density of the mixed meadows is a is a good uh, a good procedure. I will do a sensitivity sensitivity analysis of these parameters of the of these of these uh, of the density of the of the meadows in terms of the coupling parameters. So here, what I did is I plotted the different regressions uh, similar to the ones before for different coefficients, not the um, uh, not necessarily symmetric, as you can see here in the right, you have the, the table. So each color corresponds to a different set of coefficients uh, that in the in the left uh, in the left figure correspond to a regression. So you see that the, the slope changes very much uh, depending on the um, on the um, on the coefficients. So with this way, uh, we say that we find uh, a systematic way of fixing the couplings uh, in mixed meadows because so like if we find another another if we want to fit another set of of um, another sorry another couple of of species uh, we'll be able to find a slope on this model that fits the data uh, and also this this model gives us some um, some uh, um, idea or some and shed some light uh, on what the local interactions might be mediated by. So what we saw is that we have to, the model is fitted by uh, gammas uh, that are smaller than one. So this means that for Caulerpa prolifera and Timodociano dosa, the shoot densities, uh, I, the, the shoots compete more, compete less with the other species than the shoot with their own species. So this means that there have, might, might be some resources uh, which they, they use differently. So in this sense, we can say, for example, so uh, we know that also they have uh, different roots, different root lengths, and the roots are like go deeper on the, um, the roots of Timothea go deeper on the ground than roots of Caulerpa. So this happen, what this happens is that they don't have to compete. Um, they compete for different parts. So they compete less with the other, with the other shoots because they use a different, a different uh, region of the ground to get nutrients. So, okay. This, uh, and also another thing is that, um, that so far we have used uh, uh, an unrealistic set of initial conditions, like a, a similar density of both uh, meadows or the same density of both meadows to start with. But what happens in, in nature usually is that there are two meadows that uh, of the different species that collide and then they might mingle or not, or depends. So what we are doing here is also checking that, that the model, uh, that the results don't change on initial condition. So on the left, what I have is, um, is I start with a different initial condition that creates a, a front. And I see that with the time, this front disappears and I end up having a, um, an, um, a mixed meadow the, the same as before. Also, okay, I still have time. Also, I so so this was so far for Caulerpa and and Thimodocea. I can do it also for uh, Thimodocea and and Posidonia Oceanica. In this case, I have a different uh, type of interaction because Posidonia Oceanica has uh, uh, longer li longer leaves, so usually and and stronger, so it usually shadows the the Thimodocea nodosa leaves. So the Thimodocea usually doesn't enter on the, on the, the, the meadow of, of Posidonia Oceanica and there is a clear front between them. 
So I can reproduce this, this choosing a coefficient for the Simonciano that was a bigger than one and uh, a small coefficient or a small coupling for the Posidonia Oceanica. Uh, this generates this type of drawings. Uh, here I have the evolution of the system. So the blue is the Posidonia Oceanica and you see that with time, uh, the Posidonia Oceanica displays completely the Simon Oceano dosa. Uh, and this, so the rate of, of, of displacing the, the Posidonia, the Posidonia, uh, the Simon Oceano dosa is independent of, on the coefficient. So even if it's like bigger, like you just, you just need that the coefficient is bigger than one to be able to, to displace it. But what changes when I change coefficients is actually the front. So between the Posidonia and the Thymodocea, there is a region at the edge of, Posidon of the Posidonia meadow that the density is, um, is lower. So the Thymodocea can actually coexist in this front with the Posidonia. Uh, and here you see in the lower in in the lower part of the slide that I plotted the front densities of both meadows uh, for the different coefficients. So you have each dashed line is a different coefficient of interaction of the Thymodocea dosa. So this changes the um, the the front densities and also the width of the front the coefficients. So actually this would be the um, the the measurements or the 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 graphics that we should look if we need to compare to to real to real situations and then actually we need we are waiting for some data of the front densities and the width of the front to be able to to fix these these coefficients also okay and once we have these coefficients, what we can do is actually add uh, temperature effects. So uh, Posidonia Oceanica actually is very damaged by climate change. So there it, has, it has a threshold of 28 degrees. And after that, its mortality increases linearly. And, and this, this was studied by Nuria Marva in this paper, and they have uh, so 28 degrees of the surface is the surface water temperature. So they studied how the mortality depends on the surface water temperature and, and they show it grow linearly and using expectations of how the, the mortality or how the, of how the sea water will, the sea water temperature will change with time. We can actually model how the decay of the Posidonia will be. So in this, in this graphic, what I have is I initiate the simulation with a healthy meadow with a mortality that it's lower than, that, that uh, is lower than its branching rate. So it can, it can uh, create a stable meadow. And when I have this stable meadow, I change the mortality and, uh, and, and make it dependent on the temperature. So we have that I have a, like an exponent, very fast exponential decay. So and in around 50 years, a healthy meadow that it's under uh, under the under uh, temperature pressure, it will disappear. And also we can do that uh, with the Thymothea interaction. So so here I have a a different situation as the one before. So what I do is a, a completely different situation as the one before, because before the Posidonia was displacing the, the Simodocea meadow, and now here, since the Posidonia is uh, it's in regression, so at 100 years, its density is very low, it can be conquered by the Simodocea meadow. So, here I, I have the different front densities of the, um, of the Posidonia and uh, the front densities of the Posidonia and the Simodocea. And we see that they are, uh, they, are, they are constant or more or less constant until a moment the, that it kind of explodes. So this is the moment when, uh, when, the, when the Simodocea uh, 
conquers the, the, the Posidonia medal. And this, this time changes, this moment changes depending on the coefficient. This is the right uh, graphic, the right lower graphic. And uh, yes, and depending on when we fit these coefficients, we will know at which density uh, the Posidonia, the Thymolacea will conquer the, the Posidonia meadows. So, okay, this is more or less what I wanted to say. Uh, uh, as a summary, so what I did is I did a model for interacting seagrasses and I show you how to, how to systematically fix the couplings in mixed meadows. And I reproduced uh, field observations for Thymolothea nodos and Colerpia prolifera. And also show you uh, in the, like how we can reproduce interactions between Posidonia and Thymolothea and with a, in a global warming scenario. And for future work, uh, what, what we have to do is, this was so far local interactions, and it will be interesting or necessary to add long range interactions. And also another thing that we can do is study other species like three tropical species and to see because this model is like easily extendable to like n species. So to see how difficult it is the, um, to, to reproduce these species and how and if they can shed some light about, uh, about the mechanisms of interaction between these tropical species. Okay, that was it. Thank you. So if you have any questions, is, please. Is, is Thomas still here? I don't know. I, yeah, okay. Yes, I, yes I'm ah, still right, okay, okay. okay. So, well, if anyone has some, any questions about the work? Um, I, I would like to ask if possible. Of course. Okay. okay. Yes. Um, so I was just curious about the, um, the, the form of the interaction uh, you had with the parameter R which I think is, is at the start. Um, yes. Okay, so, oh, sorry, I have some noise. Okay, uh, so um, can you explain maybe the, um, I, I understand uh, the self-interaction you explained very well. I mean, you have the um, overpopulation and competition with itself, uh, et cetera, but, um, why is the species interaction form kind of like in the same manner? What is, why, why do you use this? Where does this uh, kind of expression come from? If there is any intuition about it? So, well, the th um, so the thing is at, at, at the, um, okay, how do I explain this? So in a more uh, like, uh, um, okay, this, this way the densities in a sense, what they, what they show you is like, so, so, so the ramification will depend in this way on the density, uh, like the, the part, uh, the self interaction on the density uh, for over like, and it will uh, reproduce uh, the um, real effects for the penalizing over and underpopulated regions. So it should act the same way also, but when I have two species. But at this, at this time, I need to check and need to kind of weight uh, the, the densities of the other species, of, of the two species. So some of them are more damaging for my plant than the others. So this is kind of the, the intuition behind it, but on a like more mathematical level at the end, when you want cross interactions, what you do is uh, like do different multiplications of the terms of row one and row two. So actually, if you plug row one inside the, the branching, the branching rate, you will see that you have different cross terms. Also, that's another explanation. I don't know if that was clear. Oh yeah, that's that's totally fine. <laughs> I'm good with polynomials. Thank you. Okay. Exactly. Uh -huh. That's good. <laughs> Anything hey. else? Hey Eva, I have another question. Yes. Thanks for your talk, by the way. It's very interesting. 
Um, so I have a question about uh, the slide you showed just before the end, the one before the Outlook slide. Yes, getting there. This one, yeah. Um, so the, the, the figure on the lower left, if I understand correctly, um, the, the black curve are mm -hmm. densities or front densities of Posidonia and then the right curve is the density of Cimerothea. Mm. The, the, so, so you see the right that, curve or the black? What the, well, so, what? so if I understand this graph correctly, uh, around say around 70 years, you see that the black curve densities of, of the black curve, they decay. Yes, exactly. But, but then there is, there seems to me to be a lag of around, what is it, 40 years or so until the, the solid yeah. red curve starts to increase in density. Yes. Is that right? And how can yes. you explain it? So, because what happens is, so the Posidonia starts decreasing its density, but it has a margin where uh, still the Timothea cannot, cannot cross or cannot enter. So it will decrease until the density is low enough for the Timothea to conquer the space. So there is this lack of time that changes depending on the coefficient because the coefficient is the measure of the um, or measures the density or with where these two species uh, or the of the front density where the two species coexist even if they usually don't coexist but I don't know mm. uh, okay is it <laughs> clear or no yeah yeah or I think I get it yeah okay thank you you're welcome. Hi Eva. Thank you for the talk. Hi. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I I have some questions. Uh, no, se oye? no, I am Okay, okay, okay. Don't worry. Um, first question is um, when you fit the Kauler Panthimodocea model uh, with the gamma parameters, are you still using the, the symmetric case or yeah. are you having different case of gamma symmetric case, no? Yes. Is a symmetric case. Okay, and, and have you considered to, to try to fit the gamma independently or you don't have enough the way is, to do it? So the thing is, so here, what I, in the next slide, what I do is actually check what happens if it's asymmetric. Mm -hmm. So, and you see that this slope changes. Mm -hmm. So for the, the, the purple points are the symmetric case. So you see 0505. And, uh, and the others are the symmetric. So the slope is different. So it fits actually with the symmetric case. It's mm -hmm. like this. I mean, data. Okay, okay, it, but, but, it but it's something because the, of, the, of the data we have or is it because of the data. Or? It's because of the data. Just the, the data fits with the symmetric case. Okay, nice. <laughs> okay. And another question, a little bit related with this gamma parameter. Mm -hmm. I see that you um, differentiate when you have a monospecific meetdown and when you have a mixed meetdown, depending yeah. of, of if this gamma is um, uh, bigger than one or smaller than one. Um, as far as I know, uh, there is uh, meetdowns of Timodocianados and Cablerpa that are mixed or than separate. And mm -hmm. it doesn't sound natural to me that the um, control parameter is this. Um, um, couple term, no? I mean, yeah. The thing is, see, yeah, this is not complicated, but in the sense we don't know. So we only have like uh, when you see a mixed med, or like a a, um, a monospecific meadow of Caulerpa, you could have said with no Simodothea around, you could mm -hmm. say, okay, this there was no Simodothea ever here, and there is no possibility that you count this as a monospecific metal for, because of the interaction. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? But yeah. when, and when we have a front, you cannot know how this front will evolve. I mean, you can, but we don't have the data of what will happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't know how long Exa this front be there, no? Something like that. Exactly. So we don't have yeah, enough data in that sense. The only thing that we can say for sure is that mixed metals exist. So that's what I would say that these parameters have to be smaller than one mm -hmm. and that the other cases might be an intermediate state to get to these mixed meadows just in case that they were like 
mm-hmm. uh, appearance um, of one, the other species. I don't, I, but I'm not sure. And um, maybe if we had one of the gamma smaller than one and the other bigger than one, we can then make that maybe the the mortality. No, because then then it will. So this case is this. It okay. will not mix. Because if one is smaller than one, you create uh, the front. Mm-hmm. It's enough with one of them to create this front. Because the other the interaction is so so high that the other doesn't want to enter. Okay. Okay. The region. So I don't know this. Yeah, I totally agree with what what you said. Okay. Thank you very that, much, Eva. That's a good point. I have one one short question, if possible. Yes, of course. Yes, that when you fit in the data that you choose the symmetric case, but you choose is equal to one half. Yes. Why is that? So is that normalized to something, or what happens to you instead of uh, one half, you put uh, the two equal to 0.6 or 0.7? Uh, so okay. I chose the one half. So the normalization, I mean. So one well, half is a, is a general one, thing, or is specific value you fit it? So it's a specific for the for the case of the data I have, and so I. I have this formula for the for the for the weighted density. So this if if this gamma is one half, I reproduce the data. If it's not, if it's not, I get different slopes that don't reproduce my data. But the different slopes is for different values of each gamma. Yes. So so the slope, yeah. But so here you have the table on the right, and and these are the different coefficients. And in the left, I didn't plug. I didn't um, show the slows, but you can really see that that they change. But I mean, this you put here values that sum one. Is that because of definition, or is just a choice? Uh, you mean the the first the first one, the the row one here? It's because it's one. Do you mean that? Why in this the, one? In the, in the table, in the table, that table. Yes. Okay, you, choose, you choose values such that the gamma theta of the gamma caulerpa sum one. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I didn't understand. Yeah, uh, if they don't sum one, I will also. So, yeah, okay. Good point also. Uh, I chose this to get a, to get a, like a good, a good picture, let's say. But if I chose others that are not one, that, I, that don't sum one, I say I get uh, other slopes. But it's true that there are a couple, sometimes, there are a couple of parameters that reproduce the same slope. So if they would on some one, I will get different slopes, but they will not be this nicely aligned. And sometimes they, yeah, they coincide. I need, this is true. I need to, yeah, explain that better. Okay. Good point also. Thank you. Anyone? Can, can I ask a question? Sure. So you said, or Thomas said that you worked on quantum gravity and things like that before you... Um, <laughs> so what made you change your area of work? <laughs> um, yeah, a couple of things, I guess. I was, was a bit um, tired. Uh, I thought that the... Yeah, to say this recorded is a bit. Yeah, okay, let me, okay, let me, Leah, yeah, you're right. Okay, should I stop <laughs> but, the recording but, and then you no, answer the no, question? No, I will, I will, I will say it. It's okay. No, I thought that the field was a little bit stuck. I, it was not moving forward. At least I, I was not there for many years, but for me, I felt it was a little bit stuck. And also, uh, you specialize very much here. You, like, you, like, and it's not so I felt that doing complex system, systems, you can go changing, doing different applications, you learn different tools, and also you apply them or try to apply them, talk to biologists. I think that this is yeah, much more fun. So <laughs> yeah, well, I, I agree, yes. So. <laughs> Anyone? Another question? Well, maybe one more question. Maybe it's very straightforward, yeah. the answer, but um, 
uh, what would happen, do you think, if you would add uh, a third species to your model? Would the uh, dynamics be very different then, or? No, I would, no. I think it's, it's actually quite easy in the sense that with these two rules, if I know that there are species that coexist, I would put species uh, like with coefficients less than one, and I will try to, I don't know, and the others, if they don't coexist or if they create domains, I will put the interactions more than one. It's a bit more complicated because then you have like, I don't know, more parameters. So you have three, like two, well, you have uh, six, six in interaction parameters. If you have three, for example, but I don't think it's gonna it's gonna be very difficult. Also, the like the code I wrote it's already like generalized for more species, so it would be interesting. Also, as I was saying, for tropical species because they they like I don't know what happens there. They have like six species coexisting and they don't understand the mechanisms among them. So it could be interesting to see if this could shed some light to that. But okay, thanks future work. Yes. But more interesting lo long range interactions, I think. This just, yeah. More questions? Yeah, I'm, uh, I just want to say that I'm sorry because I was trying to... Uh, Lisa is going to ask a, a question. Ah, okay, uh, good, good. Uh, she, she's trying... Uh, ben, ben, Lisa. <laughs> Hi. Hi. OK, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. <laughs> very interesting talk anyway. Um, just two very far, uh, fast questions. Uh, one is a clarification about the effect of global warming on the model. Like, huh. it increases interspecies interaction uh, competition. Uh, I don't know if I would. Yeah, say it like that. In in this in this case, what happens is that uh, since the um, since the Posidonia decays, the the Timothea gains terrain. So the model, so the, the system is still led by the Posidonia. Mm -hmm. So if the Posidonia wouldn't decay, the Posidonia would occupy the whole space. In other cases, where maybe when increasing the temperature uh, would decay one species, but increase the other the other uh, capability to 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 grow the other species capability to grow, this would be m more interesting. But in this case, it's still like yeah, I don't know if I would say that increases competition. The competition is what it is, and it like the evolution it depends on. The, okay. the, the, of the mortality okay okay that depends on the temperature okay like and that. the other one just a curiosity about the other model like um it covers limits that your model doesn't cover or it's just a um, different model yeah well uh the thing is that model uh, it, what it does, so it's easier to simulate for uh, bigger, like longer, um, yeah, bigger spaces. Uh, but in principle, if they, they should be the same, of course, they would have differences. We haven't compared all the details through. So we are, so like Damia, Roland, and Paolo are adding some effects, I'm adding others. So I don't know. But in, in general, they should, they should reproduce the same okay if we do it correctly okay okay thank you You're welcome any other questions or comments or 
Okay. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that I, I didn't, yeah, I apologize because I couldn't, somehow I didn't have the pointer, like I should have done something different, and I was talking without a pointer, so I hope it was understandable, like now, yeah, but anyway, yeah. All right, then yeah. um, thank you again, and um, so the next seminar will take place next week. Uh, Raul, I think, will be speaking, and then the, the, I'm gradually making more and more talks uh, available on the public um, calendar. But we, we, yeah. So, but please keep also suggesting speakers if you, if you can think of anybody. Right, that applies to everybody, not only senior people, but also students or postdocs. If you think there's somebody who, you know who could give an interesting talk, then let me know. Okay. Good. Thanks. All right. Okay. Bye. 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 Thank you.